Hello, everyone. Welcome to the session. My name is Ryan Virubhotla. I manage technology and cloud partnerships for SAP. Glad to be here. Glad to see you guys. I wanted to spend the next one hour, and I have my colleague from HANA Product Management here, Mike Ekret. Both of us are going to cover a very, very, what we think is a very interesting topic. Architecting for a real-time business in the era of big data, and there are two key themes there. One is real-time, which signifies instant processing, immediate response times, right? And big data on the other side talks about petabytes of data, terabytes of data, all the complexities of managing a very large data set, which doesn't necessarily go with instantaneous response times. So in the, in the title itself, there's kind of a conundrum, managing a real-time business in an era of big data, right? So in the next one hour, we wanted to kind of show you what SAP and VMware is doing to help you in this. So hopefully, before you walk out at the end of the hour, you'll have an appreciation on the efforts that SAP and VMware together are putting to solve this very big, very problem. How do you manage a real-time enterprise when your data volumes are humongous? Okay. So I guess the couple of intro slides, and this is very self-explanatory, that the age of digitization is here, and we are collecting vast amounts of data, and the technology is here to make a difference. I've seen real great use cases. Take any industry, start from retail, manufacturing, healthcare, where technology is making some fundamental difference to our lives. My favorite example is healthcare. If you take about a year back, and this is a real life scenario, if you have a cancer patient and he goes in for a treatment, it takes about 10 days to get the genome of the cancer patient analyzed and if, before a doctor can prescribe any medication for that patient. But you know what? 10 days is a long time. Now we have technology where it can be reduced to seven hours right now, and the goal is to bring it down to one hour. So you're talking about vast amounts of data, human genome, with all the permutations and combinations, and looking at all the genome deficiencies, and coming back with an answer within an hour. So the technology is there, and the tool set is there. And that is what I wanted to kind of, if there is one takeaway message, is that the technology is already there to make a difference in everyday lives. Take retail. Gone are those days when the POS data is a kind of sitting on a shelf doing nothing. Almost every company that I know from a retail field now, any progressive company, has a plan to explore, extract, use the POS data. All the way to companies like Burberry that actually use the data to do a personalized plan for you, a concept of a personal shopper. So the technology is here, data is making a huge difference, and there is tremendous amounts of data with digitization. But with data comes the problem of complexity. What we are realizing at SAP is over the years, our customer environments have become very complex. What it is doing is it's, it's stopping for our customers from adopting all the new innovations, it's kind of slowing them down from an agility perspective. In a lot of ways, restricting the IT departments to, to be really servicing the current landscapes rather than focusing on making a big differentiation for the company, competitive differentiation. Along with the data problem, what is happening is you have a data explosion. You have multiple transaction systems feeding multiple analytical systems. And there's layers of abstraction in between, aggregation in between, where you, you have a real-time data captured in your transactional system, and you extract it to an online data store, take it through a data warehouse, some data marts, and by the time you actually get to using the data, it's probably out of date. There is a severe latency issue between the time you capture the transaction to the time you actually analyze it, and that is not a real-time enterprise. We have to find a way of optimizing the layers and collapsing the layers. 
Complexity is the real enemy, and this is a saying that uh, Bill McDermott, our CEO, used to say, simple is the ultimate form of sophistication. We need to find a way of optimize the layers, take away the latency between the layers, and optimize the solutions. And hopefully, HANA and our new cutting edge applications help you get there. And that's the topic we want to broach today. I'll click through all, I mean, this is self-explanatory. I mean, that, does anyone here, and I want to poll the audience, does anyone get, have not have a complexity problem? This is something that every IT department that I talk to kind of readily acknowledges that systems are very complex, and you need a way to simplify them. You need a way to optimize the layers. You need a way, and this is where products like HANA come in where you don't have aggregates. You can run your OLTP and decision support on the same system without aggregates, a real game changer. And these are the things that I want to go through and, and how HANA can be set up in your environment. So a couple of words in terms of what we do with our partners. We believe in an open ecosystem. We work with a wide cross-selection of partners, uh, right from Silicon, Intel, all the way to infrastructure partners, server partners. HANA won't be complete. HANA won't be where it is without the help of our partners today. They've been part of the HANA journey from day one. And VMware and Intel are the two examples that I want to kind of spend a couple of minutes before we go into the depth of HANA and the, the implementation considerations. From an Intel perspective, I want to really acknowledge the great work that Intel has been doing with us. HANA wouldn't be here today without the help of Intel. They do, they do help us with the low-level programming. So it's a bi-directional symbiotic relationship. We optimize HANA for Intel x86 chipset, Xeon, E7 now, before that Westbeer and Nahalem. And on the reverse, Intel actually optimizes their chipset for us. So when they built Ivy Bridge and now when they're building uh, Haswell, they're putting in new feature functions just to kind of enable this real-time transaction processing using in-memory databases that includes support for larger memory sizes, that includes support for no more number of cores. It, it's all the throughput and RAS considerations that you need to have when you're talking about an in-memory database. That is the beauty of the Intel relationship. It's beneficial ultimately to the customers because we are optimizing our core to Intel chipset and the other way around. Intel is building great features uh, to make their code set efficient on, on HANA. From a VMware perspective, this is a long-standing relationship. We have been working with VMware oh, for quite for more than 10 years, uh, ever since I've been at SAP, and I've been here for now eight years. And most of the SAP products now run on VMware, and it's a great relationship. Really, if you look at SAP, our simplification story, run simple message, resonates very well when you talk about what VMware does to the infrastructure layer. Optimizing the layers, virtualizing, and getting more use of the resource is exactly what VMware is all about. So there's a quite a lot of complementary feature function set between what we do and what VMware tries to do in the overall scheme of things. One example where I want to kind of uh, focus in on is, we, obviously SAP is all about HANA. Those of you who have not heard, I'll be very surprised if anyone hasn't. HANA is our platform. Everything that SAP does is based on HANA as the underlying platform. And that cuts across whether you're talking about on-prem, cloud, or mobile. And, and, and so our flagship product, if you will, is HANA. And recently, we announced HANA production instance availability on VMware. And that's a big milestone. A lot of our customers have been asking us for this information for this production availability of HANA on, on production instances. To give you some scale, typically, I mean, those of you who work with SAP quite a bit, our process of going from uh, announcing a ramp up or limited availability to general availability is pretty long. We go through an extensive series of testing and gates before you could actually certify. In this case, we have done it less than a month. That kind of shows how much of a customer demand there is in, in running HANA product instances on VMware. 
from our perspective, it's really groundbreaking that we are able to um, complete this uh, certification and make it generally available within uh, one year. I have the press release. Most of you, I mean, those who follow VMware and HANA probably have seen this. Uh, right now, it's got some limitations in terms of size and other things, and we have a plan to address it. Multiple VMs, the size restrictions, and Mike will go into all those details. My final slide, and I think it's very self-explanatory. I mean, all of you, you are here in a VMware conference. You understand, know what the benefits of virtualization. Hopefully, you've heard enough about HANA to interest you. When you combine HANA plus virtualization, that's a great message. And, and there are a lot of customers out there who are getting significant benefits. I want to give two examples, and two very good examples near and dear to my heart. One is uh, Mercedes. AMG division, they're live on uh, Sweet and HANA, so SAP's flagship ERP product. Using VMware virtualization, they've been live for now a couple of months. So here you have a customer who is already in production. The other example is EMC IT, who are also again live uh, with virtualization and HANA. And they, there's even a published case study. I believe there is an EMC session that happened today, this morning. I don't know if any of you attended, but there is a published case study where they have seen uh, CapEx benefits of about 60% and OpEx benefits of around 55% when they combine virtualization and HANA together. So great success stories, great messages. I hope in the next half an hour, 45 minutes, you can see the journey and I kind of understand a little bit more when I say HANA and virtualization. How do these things come together? At the end of the, uh, so we, we have the next half an hour dedicated to a little bit of a product detail. And towards the end, we can, we can have a Q&A session. Without further ado, let me introduce Mike Ekret, my HANA product management colleague. Mike. Thanks, Ryan. Okay, so we're going to go a little bit more technical, so thanks, Ryan, for the introduction, and we'll drill down on a lot of things that Ryan covered. So we're going to cover what is HANA. So people may have already known what HANA, but I think it's going to be a little bit of a recap, but also the latest innovations that we have with HANA. So why did we do SAP HANA? So HANA is something that is now four years old um, as a product. Um, it's something that has a long history at SAP, and it was basically built for one main reason. It was the, that first slide that Ryan showed you with the zoo of many different processing engines, databases, um, all the ETL moving up data. And we looked at it. We had a major problem with our transaction systems, which are OLTP, our OLAP analysis. So if you want to do real-time operational BI, you had a problem because you had to move it to a data warehouse. And then, you know, if you want to think of our first generation of in-memory, it was basically an in-memory cache. And if you think about it, there's a lot of people doing this now where they're basically saying create copies of the data. For our, us as an application development company, this became a major problem. Because this is moving data, and if you think the OLTP data model, the OLAP data model, and the cache are all different data models. They all require movement of data. They all require aggregation of data. They require different security. They require different system management. IT spends about 80% of its budget just making sure the bytes get from A to B to C correctly. So what we did was we had a, a long look at what are required to write applications. And this is where we came up with SAP HANA, which is basically take out all of the issues, the complexity, which is basically why can't we have one data model that does OLTP and OLAP and all the processing types at once? Well, in the past, it was because it was technically possible. We didn't have the horsepower. We didn't have the technology. Uh, we didn't have the software to do it. So we basically built a new and in-memory database. And on top of that, we built a whole new application platform. I'm going to go through the next slides, what that is, what you can do with it, and how that affects your landscape. Because it is pretty um, radical when it was first announced. We had, um, actually, I believe in this event center, somebody laughing at us saying we're smoking drugs. But as you can see now, they're all copying us. So I think that's kind of a bit of validation. Um, and we probably know the guy who races yachts who said that. OK. so. This is the, if you want to say, very technical slide. But at the core of HANA is a completely asset compliant in-memory database. That's what database services are. It is a relational database. Uh, it has full HADR. It's full asset compliance. So if you're on the show floor here, you'll see a lot of vendors that work with us, like the NetApps, the MCs, things like that, the storage underneath. 
It's built on Intel servers, so that was a co-innovation with Intel. Intel sat with us for three or four years before we actually shipped the product, and we actually influenced together what is actually in the Intel chipset, and they influenced what's in our software. So the core database is a relational database. So anything like you would know Oracle, DB2, anything like that is a relational database, but it's 100% in memory. It is a database that supports both OLTP and OLAP processing on the same data models. So you have no need to pre-aggregate data, you have no need to materialize data, you have no need to create cubes. Cubes are just a view on the data. Okay, so we didn't just end there because that's not just how applications, applications are just not just data stores. So we also built in, if you look underneath here, is application function libraries and data modeling tools. So we actually want you to be able to model your application directly in the database. So in the past, we had many layers. If you think of client server, we had clients, we had applications, and we had the DB layer. What we're doing now is using the horsepower and the engine to be able to join, process, and process data all in one statement. That's really the, the view that we do. And we spend a lot of time just managing data as it flows from DRAM to the L1, L2, L3 cache. We really don't care that much about how it flows to block devices because it's all in memory. That jettisons a lot of baggage from our database. Uh, we do have block storage underneath if, you, if the power goes out, obviously, but um, that's really just there for an HADR scenario, not for processing. So we have built into HANA predictive analysis libraries, and we'll talk about some examples of how they're used. Business function libraries, so these are actually functions like doing allocations over a cost center. These are actually things that typically will be in the application server layer. We've actually built them in there. We also built a data modeling and a store procedure language. So most people know store procedures from databases, whether it be T-SQL, PL-SQL, whatever. We have our own store procedure language. It's called SQL Script. And that's basically where you can actually do very complex, uh, if you want to say, data processing. Above this, we actually built the processing type. So if you think of one data model, it supports OLTP, OLAP. We also built a text processing engine. Actually, the long history of SAP HANA is that it came out of our uh, enterprise search tool. We actually created a memory cache as it basically crawled your whole enterprise, searching all your documents, all your websites, all your document stores. And we actually turned that into an OLTP database. So text analysis we have there, which is text analysis is basically processing on structured data and being able to do things like sentiment analysis. We'll give some examples later. We also included into HANA, and this is where if you think things are getting really evolutionary, we also put an events processing engine inside HANA. So why should your complex event processing engine be in a separate database? Why should your OLTP be a separate database? Why should your OLAP be? And you think about predictive at the bottom, why should predictive run in a separate database? So if you think of best of breeds, why do I need uh, an OLTP database like Oracle? Why do I need a SAS? Why do I need a um, Documentum? Why do I need Endeka? Why do I need Hyperion? Why shouldn't they all run in the same database? Why do they need to be on separate data stores? Because if you think about it in the past, it was always like, I bought a new application, I need a new data silo. So we were trying to tackle that. Then we added spatial. So if you think about spatial databases, typically it was a database that was tuned a certain way to handle spatial characteristics. So we actually included spatial. So when we model, you just indicate that one column in the data, and it's a column or in-memory database, is spatial. So it behaves with spatial processing types, so you can't do additive things like on geotagging. So if you think of geo-coordinates, you don't add them together. They have a different processing type if you want to add and subtract them and things like this about co-location. We didn't stop there. We also built a business rules engine into HANA. We built planning functions into HANA. And then, of course, the, what's here is calculators. It's not the uh, HP little calculators. This is basically all the calculation engine into HANA. So we put those all into one database server. You don't need to have different data models, but you get basically have been exposed all those capabilities. On top of that, we have something called extended application servers. We didn't just end there and say all these core database engines we're consolidating. We actually built an application server into the database. So if you think of now things where in the past you had an application server, like a Java application server, you can now run application code inside your database. So think about what that means to your landscape, about compressing it. So it's really about simplifying. So we have an application server. We have a JavaScript engine inside it. We have a UI building. So obviously, for people who want to build applications, and this UI building is based on HTML5. So we have a web server inside there as well. So think about that, what it means to your landscape. Think about what it means to your application developers. You don't have to have a sprawl of that sprawl we saw on the first slide of all those things together. And then on the right side, we included all the lifecycle management. So you can build an application, and you can move it through your environment. And then on the left side, we had all of the application 
um, development tools, the whole process orchestration, how you actually actually run them. And this is basically what SAP HANA is. It can be deployed on an, an appliance, pre-built pre appliance from one of our hardware partners that you get off the shelf. It can be custom-built appliance, or it can be deployed in the cloud. Now, why it's important is because a lot of applications you'll get from SAP and our partners in the future will actually be powered by HANA, and this is actually what it's running on. So a lot of people will not necessarily buy HANA to build your own applications. You might actually buy it from SAP and your business users and your CFO or your uh, supply chain or your CMO saying, we're buying this application that's running on HANA. This is what it's running on. So it's radically going to change your environment. The other thing is also it's open to any app server. So if someone does want to run Java on it, someone wants to run Ruby, you can code this. It has a number of interfaces like SQL MDX. has an R interface for open source R. It has JSON connectivity. It has RESTful services. It has OData connectivity. And then on the right, top right there, as you see, a lot of applications uh, from SAP. So we're going to step through some of the use cases, and you'll see how it's going to, um, I'm going to say, change the landscape radically. So I mentioned Intel. So Intel, the latest version is obviously Ivy Bridge V2. So E7 V2 is a high-end chipset. Uh, and what we got there um, with the co-innovation with Intel is we got 50% more cores, which is not, you know, not news to you guys. But basically, the processing power and the cache improvements and how it handles large amounts of chunks of memory processing, that gave us twice the performance. So before, when we were looking at a core, we were getting 4.3 billion scans per second. We're now looking at over 8 billion scans per second per core. Why is that important? Is because in HANA data models, you don't pre-materialize the data. You don't create materialized views on data. You don't pre-aggregate data. We just calculate it all on the fly. Think about how simplifies that simplifies applications. I'll give you one example. With our business warehouse data warehouse, when we put it on HANA, we drop all the indexes, we drop all the materializing, and most people experience at least an 80% reduction in the size of their database. We don't need all these B-tree, bitmap indexes, things like this. One of the big things here was also 4x improvements on I.O. bandwidth. And this is I.O. bandwidth between the memory and the chips, but also I.O. underneath, subsystems underneath, which is obviously needed for HADR, for uh, writing uh, fully ASCII compliance if the, memory goes out, if the power goes out. We also want to support three times more RAM. So you'll see in the next few slides that we actually list one, which basically means that now we get to 15 cores per, and it's just 30 threads because we use hyper-threading. We get up to 12 terabytes per server. Okay, so if you think of this as this eight socket system, so it's eight, so 120 CPU cores and 12 terabytes of memory on a server. And you think about now we, we have a compression which is actually we have very tight compression, and we actually process all the data compressed in HANA, we typically see 5x plus compression. So if you think of a 10 terabyte in-memory system, you're looking at what traditionally would have been on disk at least 50 plus terabytes. So we're greatly shrinking the size of the systems and using Intel to do this. Um, we heavily use the Intel instruction sets and the RAS support, as Ryan mentioned. Um, how we achieve this is basically using parallelism. So we, have broke, we break down all the data in HANA into many, many smaller tables and smaller columns. So the columns are all partitioned. We partition within a single server, and then we can scale out by adding many, many of these nodes together. And the, people always ask, well, how big can you get? We actually showed a 100 terabytes of main memory HANA system, which actually took over a petabyte of data and put it in memory. And this was a retail scenario where someone like, I can't tell you who they are, but you can guess who they are. So who would have a petabyte of shopping cart data for the last 10 years of every store in the world? And we were able to ask any question about any combination of any shopping carts, combinations, and be able to get results back in less than two seconds. Any question. Without pre-materializing it, without understanding the queries, just basically allowed end users to go anywhere in the data. That's the sort of things we're seeing that's just changing it. OK, so let's move on to what we actually can do with it. So, one of the biggest things we see now is, if you look at the new types of applications, in the past, you know, the CIO had the budget. Then it became the CFO, and what we're actually seeing now is the CMO heavily is actually buying HANA. And these are ones the type of the new customer engagement applications. I'll give one example. Uh, T-Mobile are heavily using HANA to do customer churn analysis. So when you call up T-Mobile with a problem, they know exactly who you are, they know all your customer records, they know exactly what you're using, they know if you're a customer that they should be nice to. You have a nice family plan with many, many texts, and you're buying lots of stuff off their stores. Or you're a person that's just been a pain. Um, they will know what they should give you, they should retain you. They call it churn analysis. 
um, so they know everything about you. And they've built a mobile application that basically is sitting, and so it's mobile in that it sits on the desktop of the, um, of the call center rep. Um, and basically, they can tell everything about you. So it reads the CRM data, it reads, and they're actually extending it to know your Twitter data. So if you start complaining about them, they can reach out to you in advance of uh, you actually complaining about it. Um, so this is an OLTP and OLAP. Uh, ordering. So why they wanted this was the example is that they want to know if you ordered a new phone and you call them up, they should know about it. They shouldn't be like, I just ordered a phone yesterday, why is it active? They know exactly. They also know sentiment. So they're able to take all of your web posts, so your Facebook, Twitter posts, things like this, and be able to see if you're a happy customer, if you're slightly positive, if you're not, if you're saying nice things about competitors, things like this. They know everything about you. And then use predictive capabilities. So the predictive part of this is, are you likely to leave them? Are they somebody, are you somebody they should keep? Now, it's a, I know it sounds kind of crazy world that people want to do this, but there actually is some of these, uh, and they actually grade you as a customer to say, is it better that T-Mobile, you go to Verizon, or you go to AT&T, and you can be a pain for them? Or is you a really good customer that's likely to spend a lot more, buy more notepads, and buy more, you know, web-enable your car, things like that through them? So they really are thinking about how do you handle the customer engagements? An example uh, Ryan gave you about um, Burberry. Burberry used this so they know more about you than you would ever know when you walk into the store. So they know if you ever tweeted, if you have your father had ever bought a trench coat from them in the past, things like this. So they know exactly, they know exactly what you said. They know exactly if you should be a customer that they would like to have. They also know exactly where all of their inventory is from their web stores, their um, online stores. So if you're Significant other ever goes into a store to buy something, they don't have it, they'll get it to you overnight, for example. So they're building completely new types of applications. Okay, so we said about big data. So obviously most people don't think big data is to do with in-memory applications, but it really is, because what's happening is um, it's not about the first question you ask when you talk to your business user, it's about the second, third, fourth question. So what we've seen is the Internet of Things, which obviously is smart devices, so things like uh, cell phones, um, any sort of car, so if you look at your car and what you're getting, we're talking with all the major, obviously a lot of European car manufacturers, about connected car. So there actually are companies like insurance companies looking at, we will take the telemetric data of your car and we will charge you insurance by mile. Um, so there's really, if you think about this also, then you think like smart logistics, we know exactly where your packages are. And you think about something like Amazon, even if it's UPS, they know exactly where it is. So this is the sole Internet of Things. What it's doing is it's generating huge amounts of data. There's, if you think about time and, and the spatial tagging, is really, really critical. We're also seeing things which is um, basically streaming data. So what we built in HANA was also the ability to consume data streaming. So basically a streaming database, which used to be a very specialist technology. The product um, from SAP we're using is um, called ESP. Um, the idea is that anything can come in and be an event. So we have to see if these events that come from a connected device, whether it be a car, whether it be equipment, whether it be a building, reading if there's somebody in a room or not, um, you know, smart cities, which is basically what the traffic uh, uh, signals could be, the parking meters, things like this. Is the event significant or is it something that I should work on later? Is it just noise? That's basically what ex complex event processing is. And with HANA, we can actually do, in the past, CEP engines typically, if they're very high frequency, held data for five to 10 minutes. That was a window, and then they had to dump it because it was just too frequent of data. Now what we're seeing with HANA is people are creating, keeping days, weeks, and being able to do very rapid querying over to see is this a pattern. Is this a pattern that just happens monthly? Is it happen just only when the kids are going back to school? So I want to see data over years, but I want to be able to make a reaction really, really quickly. So if I'm out of whatever, Teenage Ninja Mutant Turtles, which are back again, backpacks, is that a problem? That sort of thing, to be able to see a retailer. So the big thing here is no data preparation. So we basically take the sensor data. RFID tags are a huge thing as well when, you start, when it comes to um, embedding them on devices. Everything will have them. Uh, we want to be able to do processing very, very fast. We want to do machine learning. So this is be able to be able to put heuristics in it. So be and before, when you were doing sense and respond, it was very much rule-based. If this happens, do this. And it's usually something happened in the past, and you want to make sure it never happened again. But now we're starting to see is people want to do self-learning things. And self-learning things, the, the, the big thing, if you want to say where we got ESP and the benefit of putting ESP in, machine learning is heavily used in the financial services industry. Yeah. No, person, no one person, physical person, is doing all those trades. 
ESP is actually being used by all the brokerage firms to automate trading. And that's why you see those things when they start seeing like the Black Monday or Black Friday things, is they're all automatically trading based on sensing and based on rules, and why you see things like the NASDAQ has breaks to be able to say stop it because things are going bad. But basically they're using machine learning to be able to say there's micro changes happening, I need to dump stock, I need to buy stock, things like this. And the other thing we're seeing is things like spatial processing coming in here. So spatial processing is interesting because um, if you saw what happened a couple of days ago up in Napa, um, there's actually some interesting things we were talking about how to get things like storm tracking, but I think earthquake monitoring to be able to shut down equipment. And, you know, example, Berkeley showed that they had 10 seconds warning before the shockwave hit them. Think about being able to build an application that will be able to take 10 seconds and lock down or shut down. You know, uh, it could be a valve, it could be shutting down a piece of equipment, a pump, based on a shockwave or based on, a, on, a, on an event happening. So things are, this is the type of applications we're building now. And if you think about it, the volumes of data, the complexity of the applications is not on the data models, it's actually on the data processing. Okay, planning and application, uh, optimization. So a lot of businesses are now trying to do real-time planning. In the past, planning was something you did in a year in advance, you did at the end of the month, financials. There was a big session here, uh, MC were talking about their use case of HANA, which is a lot about something called BPC from SAP, which is business planning and consolidation, which is month-end processing. So people now want to do real-time planning, but they also want to do things like when you're doing a trade promotions, they want to do things like micro-targeting. You know, this thing, when you walk into a shop, they know exactly your store, they know exactly who you are, and they're able to send you a coupon. That is planning and optimization. That is being able to do micro-targeting. Are you likely? So if you don't have kids, why send you the, uh, the discount thing on diapers, right? So they would send you the one that's like, okay, if you're single, send you the beer one, not the diaper one, that sort of thing. So what we've done is spend a lot of time with planning applications to be able to move all the processing down that was typically the application server layer down into the database. So this is all store procedures, this is integrated planning, so being able to do rapid planning, being able to do, run many, many planning cycles. And why you do many, many planning cycles is you're trying to do simulations, you're trying to say what will happen. And then you make like worst case, best case, all the different combinations, and the idea here is that I turn planning and optimization into a real-time process. So every transaction I'm running, it tells me what's the best or worst case, and I can pick a best, the, the best decision, if you want to say, make a better decision. Because decisions mostly are guessing, and you want to make a better guess when you're making a decision. So here is like adding real time, supporting very complex questions over very granular, very detailed data. Okay, so this is really what HANA is able to do with it. So HANA also, this is where a lot of customers, your customers, or if you're a customer or if you're a hosting partner, a lot of times you'll just see HANA show up underneath one of SAP's three-letter acronym systems, which is the business suite that Brian mentioned. So ERP, CRM, supply chain management, and SRM, which is supplier relationship management. And these applications are all being ported to HANA, and now they're actually doing, changing their data models and doing lots of processing down in the database. So people are just converting their existing ones, taking off the traditional disk databases, and moving to memory. So a lot of times you'll find your business people will say, I want these new features, I want these new capabilities of CRM, I want my new ERP capabilities. This is gonna need HANA. So that's where and we just had a discussion with a couple of customers and that's exactly the, the use case where they, the lines of business told IT they needed HANA. So this is what it is. Okay, data warehousing. Obviously you can imagine big analytics, being able to ask any questions of data. This is the example I gave you of that um, retailer, which is basically I wanna be able to do things I could never do before. The CFOs, if you're in retailing industries or in consumer products, fraud detection is something that's heavily used now because that's if you want to think about, you spend years trying to optimize the business processes. Now you're starting to think of things that are waste, which is like fraud. How do I detect fraud before it happens? How do I detect frauds? You know, somebody's invoicing us for products we never had. Why do I pay them if it's under $200? Can I not check everything real time? An invoice comes in or a payment or a credit card check you know, the usual things you see with like Visa, American Express, people want to run that inside their own business. They don't want to give people credit if they're just filed for bankruptcy, that sort of thing. You don't want to send them the product if they don't think you're gonna pay for them, that sort of thing. And these are the new types of applications that are taking lots and lots of data and making, you're gonna say, machine learning decisions. These are very complex decisions and you say, I wanna put in some rules, I wanna put some algorithms in to be able to do things. Network optimization is a classic one. So. Here is the network, which is the business network, but also we see a lot in IT. And if you go to the show floor, you'll have, see some of our partners actually talk about what they can possibly do with HANA 
underneath their management of their IT infrastructure. So inside SAP, we're actually using HANA to be able to analyze things that are running in our cloud. So we're able to look, do real-time detections of people probing. We're looking for patterns. So maybe they're only probing every second day at midnight from a certain IP address set or a certain country, or they're coming in a certain way. It's not a rule to say, oh, if this sort of hacking comes, we're actually looking at machine logs. We're looking at things. So um, obviously, there's a huge, even to say, segment of business that's grown out of being able to do analysis. But the, the power of HANA is I don't have to think of the query and tune the data model to the query. I can let the data be available to everybody. So the things you see here is um, obviously a lot of these logs are very, very big. We have native Hadoop integration with HANA, so therefore we can actually virtualize data from any source, pretty much any source, so any uh, OLTP database, any OLAP database, Hadoop. So a lot of times people are using Hadoop for ingest of logs, and then they want to build an application on top of it. We all know the data is valuable. So the example I give is eBay. So eBay are using, um, they also run thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of storefronts. And what they're doing is they're taking all the signals. Signals are things like how many hits, how many hits per minute are our certain stores getting. And we have one, one example we ran with them as part of the POC, which was how they can reduce the amount of people that have to look at running these stores for people to say, make sure there's quality of service, are the, the web traffic going to these stores, people finding things, so when you search that you want a, a red shoe, size nine, Michael Jordan, whatever, Air Jordan, whatever, that you can find it. What they did was they found out that um, did analysis where they actually found that they wanted to be able to sense the things like if Google changes its search algorithm, that they'll know instantaneously. Because they found one example where Google had changed its search algorithm and half their stores were not being hit. It was actually competitor stores. So they're actually wanting to do this, what they call signal analysis, and be able to do it real time. And if you think about how much stuff is sold through eBay, that is, they want to reduce it from thousands of people to actually hundreds of people monitoring the systems. Um, so text search, so HANA, I said, came out of our text search. So basically everything in HANA is natively text search. Na so this is natural language search. So if you think about it, I can actually go onto my ERP system and type sales of Red Air Jordans or whatever. And if I have that data, it will show it to me. Text analysis, obviously a huge one. Um, next one, smart data access is our virtualization technology. So this is where we're able to take data that's not located in HANA, but also source it into it. So if it's a Hadoop, if it's in a Teradata, if it's an Oracle, or SQL Server, um, we can actually build an application. It all looks like it's local data, but at runtime, we go and source it from those. Obviously, the speed depends on those underlying systems. So this real-time data integration means I don't have to move data from A to B to have it available. The speed allows me to be able to do this. And what people tend to build on top of this now is predictive analysis. So they really want to be able to use things like SAS, SPSS algorithms. How do I put that on my data? How do I put it into my application in production? Okay, business warehouse. So business warehouse is SAP's, um, one of SAP's data warehousing. This is a model-driven data warehousing solution. And as you can imagine, um, this is one of the first big use cases that we had was these are huge multi-terabyte systems. And we actually moved them from a relational disk database to HANA. And we're actually able to simplify the data models. So as I mentioned um, before, this is a classic example where we see customers being able to reduce their data volumes by 80%. We drop all the indexing, we drop all the pre-materializing, we drop all the cubes, we drop all the ODSs, they just become views. It radically simplifies the amount of layers in your data warehouse. So if you know the, the old classic way we had raw ODSs, cubes, and you basically developed a cube based on the query the user wanted. Well, now you're just creating views, and the views are materializing, and it looks like a, a, a cube, it looks like an ODS, but actually the data is just more normal form. And those actually data models can actually just be views, can just be pointing to a production system. So this is radically changing. If you want to think about how um, data warehouses are built, it's also changing where analytics is all run. So when you think about OLTP OLAP combined, a lot of operational reporting and operational dashboards are now running on the, the production ERP system, the production CRM system. I don't have to have a separate application. I don't have to have a separate database. Okay, so the example, um, latency is one of the biggest things that, that Ryan was mentioning. Um, ConAgra, an example where their latency was 20x, 27x reduced. Latency is, in, if you're moving data from A to B, you're putting latency, latency in. So moving just the operational reporting to on the live data, I don't have to wait till midnight, I don't have to wait five minutes till it gets a load in my data warehouse. Uh, another one in Korea, they is 20% 20, 20 
faster IT delivery. And this really was about how fast you can build and change an application. If you're just adding a new view, it's not another data model. It's not another copy of data. It's not another specialized engine that you're putting in. Uh, Mantis had a simplified landscape. So if you think about that first diagram Ryan showed, where I had OLAP, OLTP, if I combine them together, that's a hugely simplified landscape. I don't have to think about, you know, think about from IT management. I don't have to move data. I don't have to spend, have guys make sure the jobs ran at night. I don't have to, I have simplified backup recovery. Okay, you might say, well, I have a single point of failure, but that's what we worked on heavily was to make sure it's mission critical. Um, but basically, if I don't have all of these silos with all these different domains, it becomes much, much simpler in, uh, as a landscape. Reduce maintenance. Obviously, if you've got less systems, and you've got less copies of data, you've got smaller, smaller data warehouses, smaller um, transactional systems, this means I have less to back up, I have less to do maintenance on. Um, another one here is upfront capital. Obviously, to have all of these, if you think about before, if I had best of breed, how many servers I would need just to put up a new system for develop an application. And then, of course, the right side here is if I have a simplified infrastructure and I can just create views and I have one copy of data, I really cut down my development time hugely because I don't have to have specialists. I don't have to start. And this is really also SAP development had the problem was certain things became nice to have that you really would like in your application because it meant another engine, another silo, another copy of data, another data model. So therefore, it became like, do you really need that? Um, and those are the things that really needed. OK, so. Let's talk about data center. So data center, um, obviously HANA needs backup and recovery. So if you go to um, the EMC booth, you go to NetApp, you go to, you see all of them are certified um, to be able to uh, back up SAP HANA, recover it as a database, point in time recovery as you expect. We spend a lot of time on HADR. So with HANA, obviously people think in memory database, what happens if the power goes out? This mysterious person with a vacuum cleaner that unplugs the servers at night, you know, there's always one that everybody goes on about, or uh, where does my data go? We have persistency underneath on disk. We also have the ability that if one server in a cluster fails, another server can take over on the fly. Okay, HANA is a shared nothing infrastructure, but we've built that basically if you have a five node cluster and node two fails, the so standby can become node two in seconds. And it's seconds, I say seconds, but what happens is any queries running, we'll just wait till the data is loaded. And we actually have a lazy load process. It's not that you have to load a terabyte of memory, which takes a long time. We actually load pieces, uh, small tiny pieces of HANA. So that's another reason why we use partitioning is to be able to say, we just wait for that part to be loaded back in. And if it has to be repaired, it'll be repaired on, on the fly. So when I repaired, what I mean there is that if I have to use a log record because I read the last part that was set pointed, I can actually use logs to repair on the fly. Disaster recovery, you have a number of DR scenarios for HANA. We support both um, campus clusters, so you can have real-time replication between servers. You can have um, uh, campus clusters with synchronous replication to another infrastructure, so the other side are 25 linear miles. And we also have async for geo clusters, so the other side of the planet, if you want it to be that way. Uh, and for us, this was imp really important. We have three synchronous replication options, depending on how you want to manage your RTO and your RPO. Um, and we also spend a lot of time with VMware and Intel on this to be able to handle how we have interrupts on the server level, but also when you look at some of the, the HADR offerings from VMware as well. So obviously, uh, simplification was a big one. I've talked a lot about um, deployment options, that so you can actually deploy it um, on-premise, on appliances. You can build yourself. You can get pre-prescribed ones. You can get it um, uh, virtualized on-premise for production, non-production. Um, which uh, Ryan mentioned. Tailored data center integration is where you can build your own appliance. We also have cloud offerings as well from SAP, but also from all the uh, major cloud vendors like uh, Swisscom, T-Systems, Portugal Telecom, all the big ones offer it. And then obviously, if you can imagine, having all your data and all your users in your database, security is huge for us. We have a now web server. We have application servers inside the database. As you can imagine, making it bulletproof is something that's a big focus for us. Because in the past, it was always the one user in the database was the service user and the DBA. Now you have end users in there, so it changes radically your data. OK, so we kind of covered this already. Um, we always have a lot of questions like how to do it. There's a free of charge version uh, called the HANA Developer Edition. This is available if you just go to scphana.com. You can go log on. If you're an administrator, don't go shut down the server. You're going to have a couple of hundred thousand other developers in there with you. So it's a, you also have a one at HANA 1. 
premium pay, so this is basically 99 cents an hour to SAP, and then you pay the hosting charges on Amazon or the um, other providers. We also have SAP Enterprise Cloud, which is um, where you could run your whole applications, uh, a hosting provider provided by SAP. And then the data center on the right there, you can have bare metal single server you can have, which is the appliance at Taylor Data Center. We have scale out HADR clusters, and we have virtualized support. So VMware is the first one to support. So vSphere 5.1 or newer, we would suggest 5.5. And if you look at the roadmap, there's some nice things coming in, in vSphere 6.0 that will definitely allow us to have much bigger HANA systems. Okay, so uh, let's talk about what we have here. So we are generally available for single VM in production and non-production. We have controlled availability for multiple VMs, so where you have multiple HANAs on the same server. Control availability means is you just basically apply to VMware and SAP, and we work with you on this, and you get direct access to our development teams and VMware development teams, and we make sure everything works well. Uh, it was announced available on SP8, so HANA doesn't have different versions like a 102030. We just have HANA and a support package. A support package is a new version. Just think of it that way. And we're on the eighth version. We ship two versions a year. Um, so at the end of the year, you'll expect another version. So we shipped SP8 in May. We typically ship every six months. So you can do the math there when you think the next one will be. There's a best practice guide from VMware on how to deploy it. So obviously, um, you're virtualizing. Uh, we only support Linux on HANA. So it's uh, SUSE, Enterprise Linux, or Red Hat. Um, and of course, both of them have long histories of working with SAP and also with VMware. Um, we have uh, deployment options on certified appliance, and if you want to build your own infrastructure, which is basically taking certified servers, using your, reusing your networking, reusing your own storage to build your own infrastructure, we have a, actually a, a process where you can self-certify with SAP. Um, we have a number of VMware specialized technologies, live migration, vMotion. We have DRS integration. We have the scale up only, which is basically scale up HANA, where you can actually go from a um, 128 gig of memory HANA, you know, one socket all the way up to the, um, the 12 terabyte um, eight sockets. Um, not for scale out, we're still working on that. So you'll see in the roadmap section. The other big thing that's nice about the VMware tools, it's be able to clone and copy HANA systems to create sandbox systems, to create break fix systems very, very fast with their um, technologies. Um, Support for this, um, we have a long-standing relationship where basically you can put the, 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 your customer message in with SAP or with VMware. We have an integrated support model, so, and the SLAs are all tied together. Um, the one thing is that obviously performance issues that are not related to HANA native perf uh, performance issues that are related to vSphere will go to the, um, the center of excellence uh, in the VMware team. I should point out here the maximum size um, of a VM for HANA is one terabyte of DRAM, so not one terabyte of, of disk, and 64 V cores. That's a limitation of vSphere. That um, there'll be roadmap sessions here where I would say go and look at the uh, VM where roadmaps on vSphere, and that should double uh, from the um, the size and number of cores. And as you can see, um, we now have 120 cores, uh, physical cores, which in, if you think of um, hyperthreading, that actually ends up in 240 V cores potentially. Um, so you can divide up a big box very uh, into a number of them. So how does it look? It looks here. So we have a certified appliance where basically storage is included, internal. They tend to be rack servers. On the right side, if I want to tend to use existing storage like EMC, NetApp, any of these, Hitachi, um, I want to use, say, example, Cisco networking, and I have um, HP servers. I don't want to use HP networking um, or IBM networking. I shouldn't just pick an HP. Um, you can reuse those, and that's a Taylor data center. And then the same... Same HANA system is installed, and the same VMware approach to it. So whether you, how you build the appliance doesn't matter. Okay, future roadmap. Okay, so um, we support, so as just to recap here so we know exactly when the roadmap. So we support for production, single VMs uh, in production and non-production. We support multiple VMs in non-production. For production, you apply to SAP, and there's actually an SAP note. There's also, a, I think, a knowledge item on the VMware side that actually can link you to how you apply for that. Um, next up is support for um, more servers. So we actually certify HANA for virtualizing on all the servers. So when I say certify here, this is on the server vendor. So the IBMs, HPs, Dells, um, Lenovo's, um, who else did I miss? I probably missed a number of them, but we have 13 of them. So 
Um, these are all certified, and we're actually certifying all the different combination sizes, so the number of sockets, and the size of memory. And the next thing on the roadmap is support for scale out, so we, where we basically create clusters of multiple of these together. So you can have a HANA system that's virtualized go over one single node. So if you think about that, that means 20, 30 terabytes size of DRAM. Support for vCR6, and that will go to four terabytes per VM. And then um, on the roadmap, we have a native multi-tenancy. So within HANA, we also have native multi-tenancy. So you could have a multi-tenant HANA running within a VM. Um, we have a booth on the show floor there. It's actually a, a, a booth with Intel and VMware. Um, so it's booth um, 1641. Uh, so example here in the, the diagram here is you're seeing the single VM. Um, we are also, and just so you know why it takes time with SAP is we're running multiple tests of things like our ERP systems, our BW systems, mixed workload to make sure that we don't have degraded performance with VMware. We also make sure that we have, we don't affect HADR, we don't expect any back, backup recovery, we don't expect any workload management issues. So we're, if you want to say, being ultra conservative here because when people start moving their production ERP systems or production CRM systems, we can't afford to uh, make mistakes. So that's where we do a lot. And as Ryan mentioned, getting production support once we have a lot of tests in place, it becomes very, very fast. And then I should point out that in the next part of the roadmap, if you see here, kind of next year, we start going into new chipsets, which are Haswell from Intel and things like that. Okay, so we have a number of links here. Um, and these documents, I don't know if we're going to upload, upload them. I'm looking at Venkata or Ryan. We will upload them, I guess, wherever the VMware. I know it's not up there currently. But here's um, documents. So the, serve, the SAP note, you have to be an SAP customer, um, unfortunately. But the other ones that say sphana.com, this is all free. Um, so sphana.com is, is a free community portal. It's tied to SAP's community network. Um, and we have up there all the documents about how the overview, the guides, even the VMware guides are linked in there. So if you just go to sphana.com, you see here the best practices. SCN is the community network. It's the same user ID that you use both for sap.com and thinks it's all, as I said, it's all free. And then we have the enterprise cloud. We have HANA 1, which is this um, version that's the free one, but also the 99 cent one. Uh, it runs on Amazon Web Services and a number of other cloud information. And then um, um, all of them, if you go to this resources, uh, community resources, you actually get to link. You can also try the free one because we get a lot of administrators asking, well, how do I see HANA? How do I look at it? And this one at the bottom is basically how you would sign up for that free one. And as I said, if you're administrators, don't go shut it down. Don't go start stopping work processes and things like that because you're sharing it with people around the globe. Okay, this is my last slide, so I will take Q&A. Um, I have been asked this if you want to come to the microphone. Or, or if you want it, I'll just repeat the message, uh, repeat the question, sorry. Yes. Okay, so the question is, um, it, it, do you have to store everything in memory, or is there options to store um, some of it on disks, process it like disk databases? Um, not currently, but in our roadmap there is. So what we're seeing is that obviously people who want petabytes of data, they want to put petabytes of data in RAM, and they may say, hey, what's 10 years old? What's raw data, you know, unharmonized data? I want to store on disk. We actually are working on this. It's something we call dynamic tiering. Um, look for something at the end of the year for that. So this is basically where we start getting into massive systems. Um, when I say massive is not 10 terabytes of DRAM, highly compressed, this is when people are saying, I want to put the data lake into a HANA system. So it's going to get very intriguing. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So good question. I didn't go into the technical details, but if we do use disk, so there's two, two ways that we, um, uh, we divide data into two things in the database. One is that we have data volumes and we have log volumes. Our log volumes are synchronously written. So what we write to memory, we synchronously write on disk. So that's where we get durability that if there's a problem, we actually have an exact copy. So if the power goes out when a transaction's been written in the database, we have an absolute copy in the log. Data volumes are set pointed. And you can set it. They're typically written every five minutes. So um, you can change that. You can make it 10 minutes. You can make it one minute. Basically, what it is is every piece of data in memory is flashed to disk um, at an asynchronous process. So when I talked about the failover process, what will happen is 
I will look at the fragment of a table that I need to read for processing in the next select if I do a failover. It will read the data volume, and then it will see if there's a log to need to be able to, to apply to it. So that's where you make sure we don't have any data loss. So we're actually using set pointing. So if you think about the storage here is then if you have storage replication technologies, you can do this um, very well. If we do a backup, we actually do a, uh, we commit a set point and we use an image then to get a consistent backup. And logs can be used and you can replay black logs for days if you wanted to, if you had damaged set points. So uh, the question is, have we considered using vSAN? Um, and the answer is yes. Okay, so I'll, I'll tell you the, um, the certification for HANA um, is kind of, if you look at the show floor, that McLaren. Um, it is a very high. We actually, on the log volume, have 100,000 IOPS per second or higher. So a lot of vSANs can't handle that. But if a vSAN can, we will, we will allow it. So this is where you could bring your existing storage. The challenge is that, and this is where we're working together with the, the VMware engineers, is to make sure that we don't put in latency in there. So we can't write a log volume and lose it. And if you think about the types of applications we have, um, I can't name the, app, the company, but if you think of their web store, it's probably one of the biggest in the world, their fruit company in Cupertino, they write everything to an ERP system that you buy. Think of how frequent that is. They can't have that, that so a vSAN might not be fast enough. If a vSAN can be, and we have VLANs in here in the existing networking, and we work with Cisco on how to configure VLANs to do quality of service. So between HANA systems, there's 10 gig quality of service communication between them. We have 10 gig to the storage devices. Sometimes that has to be upgraded to InfiniBand to get the speed. So if a vSAN can do that, we, we're definitely open to it. The challenge is a lot of times vSANs are more commodity slower. So we don't want that we would ever have latency to lose a transaction. Okay, the data volumes is obviously a little less, but we can't have a set point for the data volumes. If you have 12 terabytes, it takes five minutes to write to disk. That just becomes a problem. Because then you're rolling back so far uh, that you could be going back days to get a consistent set point. So we need the speed, and that's part of the certification process when you build your own. So if it can meet the speed, and you talk to the EMC guys and the NetApp guys here, they'll explain what they do. And you can talk to them about how they talk about virtual and connected VMware. And they have certain things, and they, each one of those hardware vendors uh, from the storage side have their own configurations. So you will not build this probably on something that you had lying around gathering dust. So think of it as that's uh, it's, it's high end, but it's not so high end. I mean, people always go as the commodity servers. We support Nihalem EX, Westmere EX, and any of the, um, actually and now Ivy Bridge EX, and we just released for non-production, we support any of the E7 uh, V2 family. Um, that you can do it. So we also have some relaxed standards for non-production, but production we have, it's basically, it should be the Ferrari. I hope that makes sense, but it's, uh, and obviously now the technology is getting better that a Ferrari is not so expensive, so that's what you're hoping, but it doesn't seem to work in the car industry. I don't know why. Ferraris don't tend to get cheaper, but. <laughs> so think of it like, uh, yeah, like things like airbags and things like that are now in all the cars, so before they used to be a high-end option. Um, so. Um, hope that makes sense to you. It's like, uh, so I would definitely say talk to Cisco there here, talk to the, all the storage vendors. If you're interested in any of the backup tools, they're all here too. The semantics here, all of these, um, uh, you know, the EMC booth, they have uh, Legato guys, things like that. So if you want to talk about how they fit in there. Uh, and there's a number of sessions here as well. Uh, and you see in the show floor, there's a lot of people showing HANA because HANA um, is the fastest growing product ever at SEP. So I'm not trying to do a sales thing, but it's actually the first one, that fastest ever we got to a billion of sales. So it's, it's really selling, and um, if you want to break down on the sales, it's about, it's got to a third of them are sweet on HANA, a third of them are BW on HANA, and a third are brand new applications no one ever thought of. So Ryan mentioned the example of genomics, that we do DNA analysis, and we do DNA sequencing and analysis, um, that the best in the world is 20 minutes, and we uh, take it down to two, three seconds. So if you start thinking about that sort of analytics processing and algorithms, and it's really about algorithms, so we're going into many, many industries that you would never thought SAP would be in for, like things like um, in the past, like trading platforms, things like that, um, medical device analysis, smart metering, start putting um, uh, very complex thing in the service management, things like I said about people are looking at how do I have a chain of events that I will stop, for example, the seismic thing, that I will show shut valves as soon as I sense something like an earthquake. Yeah, so another question? Is there a way to move the HANA install away from the 
Okay, so that's a really good question. So when you do tailored data center integration, we actually have a certification class. So the, oh, sorry, yes, sorry. <laughs> good. Uh, it, are we any plans to move away from certified consultants to do installs? And we actually have, um, on scp.hana.com, we actually have a certification class that customers can actually become certified. They have to take the class and take the test. So we're not making it just you have to have a, a very expensive consultant. So we want, and if anybody, uh, the other thing that I should point out is that scp.hana.com, we also have something called Open SAP, um, which is a MOOC, you know, massive online course, open course. And we actually are adding all of the education for free. So we have education get down is something called SAP HANA Integrated Education, or Shine. It's actually something you can install. You can install on a HANA One image. We also have all the training classes for free. We also have the certification classes that we're offering. And then you, you just pay for the certification. So we see a lot of customers just picking two or three people to do the installations, and then they can do the installations themselves. So as you can imagine, when you're installing a VM or creating a new VM, you don't, shouldn't have to have a consultant to do that for you. Yeah, so we're, we spend a lot of time, actually, our education department hate us because we actually are making it all free. And for us, that means more adoption. And we, sh we should get money based on people actually using it, not people paying to just get the knowledge. Yep. Are there any plans for P2B support? Um, any plans for? For supporting P2B? Physical to virtual. Okay, so any questions? The question was, are there any plans to support um, physical to virtual? So I'm looking at Zora. Is that, yeah, is there? So, so we have, we have tools that, um, and um, there is the session, uh, I think the EMC session had one where they showed exactly about how it took um, less than half a day to move from physical to vertical. It'd be basically what we do is we back up and recover. So the HANA version is the exact same executables. There's, we don't have a different version for running virtualized. So basically just a backup recovery works. Uh, and that's very, very fast to do because basically you're just uh, loading down the disk. You don't have to, uh, if you do your last backup and it's a set point, you're basically just recovering back to the, to the database and the database just knows where all those data and log volumes are and then it starts up. So the, it can actually be the recovery can be done in minutes, but usually typically it's half a day to check everything's correct on your VM. Um, but the EMC guys, go and talk to them because they do it a lot um, when they actually do it. And then we're in discussions. There's a lot of um, uh, SIs will offer services to do it to create the first one, but um, we don't really want to make it that it's a big consulting engagement to do it. But a backup recovery is the easiest way. So you just back up your HANA system, virtualize it, recover it. We don't have a separate set of executables. There's no extra add-ins or anything like that. So any other questions? As I said, we're on the show floor, so Zora here um, for my team is actually the contact for virtualization on HANA. So if you want to um, drop by the show floor, you'll see her there. So thank you, everybody. <laughs>